The six o'clock news starts right now. He was apparently just sitting in his car. The family of a man shot and killed desperate to know why. Larry Allen Wilson shot while sitting in an SUV at an apartment complex near Loop 410 and Austin Highway. His family tells RJ Mark as they want answers and for justice to be served for the people responsible. We're lost words because we don't know what they, why that would happen. Johnny Wilson says he spoke daily to his brother Larry. The last time they talked was Thursday, a day before Larry was murdered. It looked like he was dropping somebody off at the entrance of the apartment complex. And that's where it happened. San Antonio police say Larry Wilson was shot Friday night at the Banyan Tree Apartments in the 8100 block of Cross Creek. His family believes he was robbed. He was very outgoing. He liked to cut up and joke a lot. He was always there for anybody that needed help. And that's probably why this happens. Witnesses tell police they saw a man near Wilson's SUV fire a gun at the driver multiple times and run away with a backpack. The main thing is I want to catch who did this. Why would they do this? I mean. All they had to do is ask him and they gave him whatever he wanted, whatever they wanted. Wilson says his brother was disabled and would give the shirt off his back to anyone. He says Tuesday was hard because that's when the two would get together, go for a ride in his truck and talk about life. Even though all that's happened to him, he would be the first one there to help you to do anything. I mean, he always helped me with anything I had going on. And we caught up with Wilson's family at a mortuary home as they continue to make funeral arrangements after his death. Crime Stoppers says that they will offer up to a $5,000 reward for any information that leads to the person or the people responsible for Mr. Wilson's murder. Reporting from the east side, RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. A man charged with the murder of a five-year-old boy back in 2021 was in court today. Daniel Garcia is accused of killing Dominic Aguilar Acevedo and then leaving his body in a ravine in Colorado. Erica Hernandez takes us inside the courtroom as attorneys talked about problems with getting evidence in this case and a potential trial date. Five-year-old Dominic Aguilar Acevedo was found at the bottom of a Colorado ravine on August 25, 2021. Those charged in his death, his mother, Nicole Aguilar, and his mother's boyfriend, Daniel Garcia. Garcia in court today as the prosecutor and defense attorney updated the judge about the evidence in the case. The most urgent thing from today's hearing is we need to get you both to the FBI. One of the issues brought up is evidence that the FBI has and making it available for the attorneys to see. I really am frustrated like you are and, and the prosecutor. This isn't, we're not being dilatory at all. It's the bureau is just not the easiest to deal with. The FBI, San Antonio police and authorities in Costa Rica all involved in this case. According to the arrest affidavit, Garcia and Aguilar were staying at a San Antonio extended stay hotel off I-35 in July 2021. Aguilar told detectives her boyfriend, Daniel Garcia, was abusing Dominic. The affidavit states surveillance footage from the hotel shows Garcia carrying what appears to be Dominic's lifeless body from the room. The couple allegedly went to Colorado where they left Dominic's body and fled to Costa Rica. Both were arrested and charged a little over a month later. Aguilar is still awaiting trial as her next scheduled court date is in May. Despite issues with evidence, Judge Velia Mesa made it clear that this case would go to trial. This whole back and forth is just not going to work. It's going to take us five years to get to trial and that's not happening on my watch. And if all this evidence is taken care of, it looks like this trial will go on in the middle of June. Garcia is facing up to life in prison if he is found guilty. At the Kilina Reeves Justice Center, Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. The surviving family members turned activists told lawmakers in Austin last night that if House Bill 2744 was law, the Uvalde gunman would not have been able to purchase two AR style rifles used to kill 21 people inside Robb Elementary nearly a year ago. The gunman able to purchase and use two AR style rifles and more than a thousand rounds of ammunition only eight days after his 18th birthday. The House bill would increase that age from 18 to 21 for someone to purchase a semi automatic rifle with the exceptions of peace officers, people in the military and those honorably discharged. Veronica Mata, the mother of Tess Mata, who was one of those murdered in Uvalde, told lawmakers in the community safety hearing last night, please make a change. Tess didn't have a choice in life or death, but you as leaders have a choice of what my daughter's life will be remembered for. 
Will she die in vain? Or will her life have saved another child? Maybe your child. Right now, the bill is sitting in committee hearings. The Community Safety Committee will decide if that bill will move to the full House floor for a vote. Kids today face trauma in so many forms. Secondary stress from the fear of shootings or sometimes trauma from abuse inside their own home. My kids are so brave. They're such good kids. Last week's alleged domestic violence shooting is an extreme example. That attack left a woman wounded, her 11-month-old dead, and her two-year-old in the ICU. Her eight and 11-year-old boys luckily escaped the house where this happened. The accused attacker, her ex-husband. Today, counselors reminded us about the spectrum of trauma. Abuse is not just physical, it is emotional and verbal. And just being in the presence of it causes trauma. Getting kids help early can break the often common cycle of abuse. The help is out there, you just have to ask for it. And I understand asking for help is one of the hardest things that people go through, but we're here to help. Counselors at the Bear County Family Justice Center serve children as young as six. They offer individual counseling and group sessions so kids can relate to each other and realize they are not alone. And it is all free, free of charge. If you need help, call the center. The number is right here on your screen or visit their website. New at five, a San Antonio mother's effort to make all Texas swim schools safer just got its first thumbs up from state lawmakers this morning. It's called the Michael Chang Swim Safety Act, and it would require mandatory safety equipment and training at any swim venue for children. Ursula Perry explains why this bill could make Texas the first state to regulate swim school safety. Instead of being remembered as the little boy who drowned at a swim school in 2018, Mitchell Chang may well be the namesake of a new law in Texas soon, a law that would require certified lifeguard training and a defibrillator or AED on site at every swim school for children. That is big because AED use prior to EMS arrival increases odds of survival by like 24%. I would have loved that additional 24% chance for Mitchell. I would give it anything for it. April Chang has now told her story of loss 50 or more times at the state capitol, trying to get Texas to be the first to regulate swim schools and to force them to certify their staff for CPR and other skills. It's another safeguard Mitchell apparently did not get. It turns out their training was in-house, which isn't a, a, a true legitimate certification. Their lifeguards were not certified lifeguards. They were water watchers. Well, there's a huge difference between being a certified lifeguard and just oh, being awesome. taught by someone. While she now waits for lawmakers to get her bill onto the calendar for consideration on the floor of the House, her advice to all parents is to ask for and look at the certifications before you sign your child in. It is okay in every situation your child is in to ask to see the proof so that you know your child is in a safer environment. April's fight for the Mitchell Chang law to pass is in the race for its life. That's because there's only four more weeks to the legislative session. But she's optimistic, she says, because she knows this is the right thing to do. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. The case has been covering the Mitchell Chang story for more than five years now. If you would like to know more about this family's work, as well as the foundation they've created, Look for the story on KSAT.com. Let's take a look with traffic right now. This is a Highway 90 here at Medio Creek. You can see that it is very slow going, at least in one direction here. Traffic certainly steady in the other. Now, we don't have any word about any wrecks or any construction causing this big backup, but something to be aware of as traffic is at a crawl in this area. Yeah, it is. All right, let's go outside right now. Let's talk about the weather situation. Live cam showing us some dark clouds out there, kind of reminiscent of what we saw yesterday. Is this going to kind of be the same tune for the next few days, Adam Kasky? Hey, you're noticing a bit of a pattern, right? But we will have more inconsistency in the days ahead. So the pattern not uh, remaining the same in the days ahead. You look at the radar right now, the only activity is across the Rio Grande in Mexico, coming off the mountains of Mexico. This is weakening right now, drifting southward and not exactly making a beeline for the Rio Grande. This is our primary threat zone this evening. Over the next few hours is a few storms to make it to the Rio Grande. And 
and then cross over into Texas with the potential of a rogue severe storm. That's about a 20% chance and again west a border storm around here humid. More of the same with fog and drizzle developing late and temperatures falling down through the 70s and tomorrow morning will be in the upper 60s. It's tomorrow afternoon into tomorrow night where we elevate those storm chances a bit just in time, of course, for Fiesta Fiesta. I'm going to talk more about this, get into more detail, have the future cast and get you ready for some big temperature swings and more rain and storm chances in the days ahead. We are live downtown with another metal giveaway. Hey, hey, there we go. There's Sarah Spivey, Mia Montgomery over onto the other oh. side of her. We've got a <laughs> weather authority metal giveaway at Crockett Park downtown right now. We'll be checking in with them later. Doesn't look like they're having any fun. No, not yeah. at all. Coming up, a story of a man who overcame the cruelness of the time to be an example of pride and success for his family and his community. It's a story embedded in the history of St. Paul Square that you may not have known about. And it's next. I'm Stefania Jimenez, and here's what we're working on for you tonight on The Night Beat. Saving lives one shot at a time. That is the goal of a new vaccine aimed at fighting fentanyl, the science that could help Americans stay sober and keep them from dying of fentanyl poisoning. Plus, are you older than your professors? Much older. I'm probably their grandmother. <laughs> From great grandmother to graduate, a San Antonio woman's dreams of a college degree are now reality at 97 years old. The lessons that she's learned both in and out of the classroom. We'll see you for these stories and a lot more tonight on the Night Beat. Thank you, Stephanie. We'll see you then. Well, tonight's untold history a personal story with ties to what is now St. Paul Square Historic District. We see it through the eyes of a woman whose father defied Jim Crow to become one of San Antonio's early black business leaders. Jesse Degogato brings us her story and that of Pinky Smith. All those major tourist hotels downtown on the other side of I-37, none of that was there when Pinky Smith opened his hotel for African Americans in what is now an office building in historic St. Paul Square. I think Daddy was kind of a little bit ahead of his time. Before the deluxe hotel was eventually closed and the building renovated, his daughter says she remembers well. There was a soda fountain where you could have milkshakes and malts and whatnot. There also was a dining room her mother oversaw and even a lounge like other hotels, perfect for an evening out. Everybody came to the deluxe, especially because of the cameo. The movie theater Suzanne Smith's father once managed. The cameo theater. Still under wraps, an historic there. marker the city will unveil in the near future. Further recognition of what once was. Everything up and down the street was pretty much black owned businesses. While the Southern Pacific Depot was restored, many businesses gave way to the redevelopment of St. Paul Square, like the Icky Building that eventually became a hotel. Yet when black entertainers like Louis Armstrong came to town after Pinky Smith greeted them at the airport wearing his San Antonio Chamber of Commerce jacket. They couldn't go to the hotels downtown. So they stayed here and they stayed at the Suzanne. What is now the Choice Inn Motel, Pinky Smith originally had named after his youngest daughter. So all my friends, you call me Suzanne Motel. <laughs> A funny but true part of Pinky Smith's success. Yeah, it is history. It's great. I love it. Jesse De Goyado, KSAT 12 News. Oh, it is just about that time. The party atmosphere, it's growing as the official start of Fiesta is almost here. Yeah, San Antonio ready for all the food, the music, the color, camaraderies, of course. Fiesta medals. That's the key. Gotta have Fiesta medals. And we know where you can get some impressive <laughs> medals for free. Meteorologist Sarah Spivey and me in Montgomery are yeah. here downtown at Crockett <laughs> Park. Ladies, good crowd. And that's the sound we like to hear this time of year. Yes. 
the clinging of metal. That's what Sarah's been saying all afternoon. In, this is the sound. Right. Of In Fiesta. fact, we have already given away our weather medals for the day. And look at this beautiful metal. They are incredible. So this is, let me get it for you, all of these awesome medals here. So this is, yes, the Weather Authority Medal for 2023. So beautiful, but something that's really cool about this year's medal is on the back, they have these little QR codes. And so, you know, as you're putting your sash on, you're headed out to all the fun Fiesta events over the next several days, you can just scan this QR code and it'll pop up the weather conditions and the forecast of what we're gonna be watching. Absolutely, we have been at Crockett Park with SA Metro Health. It has been a wonderful event here. There's been so many people and I officially Kristen, you, oh. Mia, for Fiesta 2023! 2023! Oh my god, it's right back at you, <laughs> sister! It's been so much fun. So yes, we're having a fantastic time and can't wait to give away some more medals at the next one. Yeah, we'll tell you a little bit more about this event coming up in a bit. For now, let's toss it back to you, Adam. And the weather cooperated for you downtown. That's the good thing about today. Tomorrow it's questionable. Yep, we've got the chance of some showers and storms. Let's get a look at our headlines here. We are in a bit of a shifting weather pattern and we're having to modify and update the forecast uh, pretty frequently here. And so you have to really check back in for the latest information. It's one of those situations because timing is changing a bit as we get more info. Dry Friday and Saturday, just think of it that way. Dry Friday and Saturday, otherwise we have some rain and storm chances and big temperature swings on the way as well. You look at the rain and storm chances, 40% tomorrow afternoon into tomorrow night. Friday and Saturday looking dry. Yeah, there's a 10% chance on Friday. That's for a stray shower before sunrise. So pretty much dry Friday, Saturday. Sunday, we boosted up to 60%. So looking like odds are favoring numerous showers and even some thunderstorms to develop on Sunday. The big question for Sunday is the exact timing. Is it going to be early? Is it going to be later? That we still need to fine tune and really uh, hammer down. Otherwise, next week, Monday through the rest of the week, a 20% chance, your typical afternoon rogue pop up shower or storm. And then we've got the big temperature swing to talk about right now. The really only threat for storms is along the border and closer to the Rio Grande. That's where we've had some development in Mexico. We talked about this a little bit earlier, this one thunderstorm in particular. And remember, we often see this, these storms flaring up in the mountains of Mexico then potentially drift, drifting eastward into our area. This one looks like it's weakening, drifting southward and parallel to the Rio Grande. So it's unlikely that's going to be affecting any of our border communities. There's still the off chance that something flares up over the next couple of hours. But if we haven't seen it by now, I think it's unlikely we'll see it later on. You look locally, a few little green spots on the map. We have a few sprinkles, that's it. Just, you know, when you're driving, you may need your windshield wipers for a quick whoosh whoosh. That's about it once. That's what we're dealing with right now. That's what we'll have tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning, low clouds, fog, a little bit of mist, a little bit of drizzle, more of the same. Then we get into the afternoon and evening and our rain chances start to rise, not necessarily by the noon hour, but later on 5 p.m. and after 5 p.m. to 1 a.m. I think is our main time frame for thunderstorm potential tomorrow. This computer model starts to flare things up near or even in San Antonio by four or five o'clock and then develops even more action. It is still too early to tell exactly where a storm is going to develop and if it's going to exactly hit your neighborhood. Yeah, this model sh shows it hitting Hondo, but it very well could be actually over San Antonio or Seguin for that matter. Just the mere fact that it's showing this development is what's important for tomorrow. We'll have a lot of instability and we'll have a weak cold front dropping in and basically slowing down as it approaches us, which should help trigger some of those showers and storms. Temperature wise, we're 79 right now. Okay, we're 80 degrees, you know, near 80 for the high temperature today. Tomorrow we start at 68, make it up to 84 for the high temperature. Southeasterly wind 10 to 15, still feeling the humidity. And again, those storm chances 5 p.m. to 1 a.m. covering about 40% of our area. Basically 40% of the area that you see on this map should be affected by those storms. And keep in mind that there is a potential for a strong to severe storm with prime with hail being the primary threat tomorrow evening. OK, larger hail. But if you're outside and downtown, hail isn't even your primary threat. Lightning 
is as big of a threat as anything. So that's what we're watching closely and we'll keep you updated on the KSAT Weather Authority app. 88 on Friday, 82 Saturday, sunny and dry those days. Then Sunday, yeah, looking at a high of 67. Monday River Parade, close to 70 for the high temperature. Big swings. It wouldn't be Fiesta without some weather questions. Ooh, yeah, right? now that's true, of yeah. course. Thanks, Adam. All right, so starting to get a little drafty. <laughs> <laughs> the Cowboys with the question of who they will draft coming up, what, next week? Next week, next Thursday, in fact. And, yeah, there's a lot of opinions being thrown around about who the Cowboys should draft, but the common wisdom seems to be a tight end or a running back, and there is definitely an RB that Dallas has their eyes on. And Madison Olguin will take her basketball skills to the University of Dallas coming up. draft is right around the corner and rumors are flying that the Dallas Cowboys will select a running back or a tight end with the 26th overall pick in the first round. The departure of tight end Dalton Schultz and the release of running back Ezekiel Elliott are fueling that speculation. And there's some talk that former Texas running back B. John Robinson could end up with the boys if for some reason he's not gone by the 26th pick. B. John just had a great career at Texas. Uh, certainly, I think uh, I don't think I've seen any any uh, set of circumstances uh, that he's not a first round pick. Uh, you know, in almost any uh, draft, uh, certainly a guy. I'm sure when uh, you know that first day's over, he's he's gonna uh, certainly have a team, and uh, you never know. Quarterback prospect Bryce Young revealed that he's limited his pre-draft workouts to just the Carolina Panthers and Houston Texans. Carolina has the first overall pick, followed by Houston at number two. It appears Carolina will draft the former Alabama QB, and if for some reason they don't, Young will likely end up with the Texans. It's also being reported that the 49ers have received inquiries from teams looking to trade for QB Trey Lance, sparking talk that the Texans could be interested in Lance because he has history with head coach D'Amico Ryans and Houston offensive coordinator. And Bobby Slowick. Congratulations to Antonia and Prep senior guard Madison Olguin for signing her letter of intent to attend the University of Dallas. She played in 38 games this season and averaged seven and a half points in nearly 19 minutes per contest. Her parents told us she was top 10 in the state for three pointers made and taking charges in all of TAPS basketball. We chatted with Madison today and asked her why the University of Dallas. During my junior year, I had made the decision I wanted to be committed somewhere already, and I just happened to pick up interest from them. And when I went to go visit their campus, first of all, their academics are wonderful, and the campus is beautiful. It's, it's much better than I thought it was going to be. And I was able to make a great connection with the coach there as well, one that I didn't think I would make anywhere else. So it really, that's what really piqued my interest there. What was that moment like for you to put pen to paper and now you're committed to this school? I think it was unreal because in that moment it was kind of just setting in like that's my decision like it's finally done it's official. What does this mean to your family that you know you have a scholarship now you're going to go to school to continue your education and your athletic career? I think it's a really big achievement because I'll be the first one in my family to play college sports. And how cool is it that it's really not that far of a drive. I mean, your family can go up there and watch you play. Yeah, I think it's the perfect fit between far, but not too far. Gotcha. It, enough to let me be ind independent yeah. and grow as a person, but also close enough to where I can go back home and, and visit my family. Absolutely. Last thing, what are you going to miss about high school, and in particular, playing high school ball for Antonian? I think I'm going to miss all my freshmen and just the team that we've collected this year and just all the chemistry we had, like not being able to build off of it again next year because yeah. I'll be gone, but I'm go really going to miss being able to hang out with them and just bonding, not just as like teammates, but as family. So I think that's going to be the biggest part. All right, top 10 in the state in charges. I told her parents, I said, it's like, she's like a little Manu and they're like, yeah, she likes to get in there and mix it up. Tough. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's Thanks, tough. Larry. Thank you, Larry. It's straight ahead, a small breach of the White House perimeter, and we do mean small, causes a big stir. How the response by Secret Service agents ended up helping keep some parents from panicking in all this. I think a lot of moms can relate to that one. The 16-year-old shot after going to the wrong house is still recovering from gunshot wounds after surgery. What the elderly suspect today told a jury 
about why, or told a judge rather, about why he shot the team. And now to the latest on the shooting of Kansas City teen Ralph Yarl. The 16-year-old was shot in the head and the arm after he rang the wrong doorbell. As ABC's Morgan Norwood reports, the 84-year-old man charged in the incident went before a judge today after being released on a $200,000 bond. This afternoon, 84-year-old Andrew Lester, the white man charged with the alleged unprovoked shooting of 16-year-old Ralph Yarl, who is black, going before judge in Kansas City, Missouri, just hours after he was released on bond on two felony charges. He has pleaded not guilty. The charges and the response by the legal community today is what should have happened last week. Lester faces felony assault and criminal action charges. The prosecutor saying there was a racial component to this case. We firmly believe that an investigation of race and hate as a motivating factor in the shooting of Ralph Yarrow must take place. Yarl was out to pick up his younger siblings last Thursday night when authorities say he went to the wrong home and mistakenly rang Lester's doorbell. According to court documents, Lester told investigators he had just went to bed when he heard the doorbell and picked up his gun, saying he saw a black man pulling on the storm door handle, adding about the shooting. It was the last thing he wanted to do, but said he was scared to death of the teen's size. Lester also says that the two never exchanged words, but Yarl from his hospital bed telling police he never touched the door, saying he was immediately shot in the head and fell to the ground and then shot again, this time in the arm, saying that Lester then told him, quote, don't come around here. Ralph Yarl, family members say he is up and able to talk and is expected to make a full recovery. No Morgan Norwood, ABC News, New York. Across America, 30 years ago today in Waco, the standoff between the religious group known as the Branch Davidians and federal authorities came to a fiery end. A 51-day-long standoff drew global attention. That standoff started on February 28, 1993, when ATF agents tried to arrest the group's leader, David Koresh, for stockpiling illegal weapons. But Koresh and Branch Davidian members refused to leave the compound. There was a shootout, and the stalemate began. The FBI eventually tear-gassed the compound and forced their way inside. Moments later, a fire began that engulfed the building. Four federal agents, 82 Branch Davidian members, including 24 children, died in the violent confrontation. Meantime, today also marks the 28th anniversary of the Oklahoma City bombing. Oklahoma City held a remembrance ceremony today. 168 seconds of silence observed for one second each person who was killed. Family members and survivors also read off each victim's name. On this date in 1995, a rental truck filled with explosives detonated outside the Murrah Federal Building. Two former U.S. Army soldiers, Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols, were convicted in this attack. The men viewed the bombing as retribution for the deadly federal raid on that Waco compound. McVeigh was executed by lethal injection in 2001, and Nichols is serving life in a federal super maximum security prison. A detention hearing for the suspect arrested in connection to the Pentagon leaked documents case canceled by the judge today. The prosecution was expected to argue that the suspect, Jack Teixeira, should remain behind bars while he awaits trial. But attorneys on both sides argued for the judge to give them more time to prepare. Teixeira is accused of posting sensitive information about Ukraine and other matters on a site called Discord. He still has not entered a formal plea. Dr. Charles Stanley, internationally known pastor and preacher, has died. Stanley spent 50 years as senior pastor of First Baptist Atlanta Church. He was best known for his television and radio ministries that reached people all around the world. His organization, In Touch Ministries, posted online that God called him home. In a statement, the mayor of Atlanta commended Stanley for making the Bible accessible to 150 countries. We'll be right back.